Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whenever you are. Welcome to the community live stream. My name is Chuck Tomasi from ServiceNow, and I am here to bring you an episode on subflows in Flow Designer and how useful they are, where you can use them, how you can call them from all the different ways. Very useful things, often overlooked, and that's my mission today. So let's get started. If you are joining us, thank you. The community live stream is a series brought to you twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. UTC, where you can take my questions that are inspired by your questions. How's that? And, and get the answers behind the answers. So lots of stuff to cover on this show. Good morning to everybody checking in. John Feist, Carol. Oh, good to see everybody here. Make sure you go over to YouTube if you haven't done that already. Like, comment, subscribe, turn on notifications. You know the usual YouTube shtick. And you'll get notified not only of this content, this isn't the only thing you'll find on the community live stream, but you'll also find things on performance analytics and reporting, on mobile. There's a wonderful mobile workshop that goes on. So if you're looking for areas, other areas on the platform, other areas in applications, that's where you're going to find it. So look forward to seeing you there. We also do this on Twitch if you want to watch that. It's available on Twitch for a couple of weeks afterwards. Just in case YouTube has a hiccup, I glance over and make sure it look, looks like everything is streaming just fine. So happy to see that. I uh, also want to invite you to go over to the developer portal at developer.servicenow.com. Get yourself a free personal developer instance, which is now available on Paris, the latest release as of last Thursday, July 23rd. Look forward to experimenting with some of that. I do have some things in, uh, my instance is now running Paris. So if we come across anything that I can show you that you can, I can point out, I will definitely do that. The other thing that's on the developer portal is blog entries and a number of these are out and will be coming out for the next few weeks around the Paris release feature. So developer.servicenow.com, if you go to the um, reference, I can't remember now. I should really look on a live screen. This is a static image. <laughs> You'll find the blog. It might, I think it's under connect. Connect blog. And there is the uh, uh, all of the articles about Paris. So you can find those there. I've written one. I've got another one in the hopper. There's more from Brad and Andrew. They're doing a wonderful job keeping us up to date on what you can expect on the platform in Paris, our latest release, which will be in general availability in September. Somebody asked me that a little while ago on LinkedIn. I think it was Saturday. So in the last couple of days, good morning, Brian and Alan and Pratyusha. I hope I'm saying these names somewhat close. I know I often mispronounce Brian. <laughs> so we'll go with that. I uh, also want to invite you to go over to the developer meetup site at meetups.com slash pro slash service now dev program. Get connected with other developers on the uh, on the ServiceNow platform around the world. It doesn't matter if it's in your time zone or not. There's one, I believe it's in Minneapolis this week. So that's close enough to me, two hours away. And uh, we're also looking at doing one in Phoenix. I think it's this week or next week. I, I had a quick email with our meetup organizer, Mike Stockman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Checking in on the live stream. Makes me happy to know that I'm not just talking to myself again. That happens when you're locked in your house for a while. You know, it's either me or the talking to the cats. So lots of great stuff. These are developer meetups for you, by you, governed by you. We just assist in helping with content. If you say, hey, Chuck, can I borrow your Paris PowerPoint deck? I'd like to share that with the rest of the team. Absolutely. If that's what we're there for. Hey, Chuck, somebody did a presentation on Flow Designer. Can we borrow that? Yes. So the meetup organizers have this access to a library of content and manage the calendars. So get together, discuss. It's a wonderful way to do this. We can even provide you a Zoom link if you don't have access to some way of doing the sharing that way. So Gaurav, good to see everybody. Ooh, we're checking in now. Let's get on with, make sure I went through everything I need to go through. Oh no, there's a couple of new things I wanna share with you. One is tell us about your app. This has uh, been going on for a little while, but I haven't had a chance to present it here. Uh, we'd like to know what apps you're building on the Now platform, and in doing so, you can help others. We'll donate 
$50 for every application you submit to the bit.ly link you see there. 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 <laughs> Backward screen. So bit.ly slash tell us about your app. Make sure you get the case on that right. It, it does have to be that camel case thing. So if you don't get it right, it, it doesn't take you anywhere. But tell us about your app, up to five apps, up to $250 to help the COVID-19 cause. You can read all the details up there. There's one other thing I want to tell you about that's brand new as of last week. Some of you may have heard this on uh, other channels, but we have launched a ServiceNow developer podcast. And when I say we, it's hosted by me, but it's two parts. One is uh, a 20 to 30 minutes in length. For one part is me talking with some of our product managers to spotlight some of the features and capabilities and get their backstories and and share that with you say hey what's the most unused thing in flow designer you can find that there uh, the other part is talking to customers about apps they've built challenges they've had and uh, we've got a few of those in the pipeline so look forward to sharing that with you it will be out every other wednesday it started last wednesday so you can do the math and what it takes the Next episode will be dropping on August 5th. So you can find the page there. It is making its way, as, of, as I record this on July 27th, it is making its way out into the various podcast directories. So if you don't see it in Apple Podcasts or Google Play, or it is on Spotify, but the search didn't turn it up, but it's there. I know it's there because I found the URL. Uh, you can always go to that bit.ly link and there's little badges there that can take you directly to those and we'll be adding more badges as it appears in those directories or you can do the hardcore thing like a lot of developers do copy the rss link paste it into your favorite rss uh, podcasting client that's that's what i did with pocket casts on my phone and it works spectacularly so look forward to talking to you more on that it's there's no demos no powerpoints it's audio only there's no update sets <laughs> and and we're gonna have a lot of fun doing that uh, sharing more information with you about the various platform features. So very excited to uh, bring you that. Let's get back to the main screen where I was going to start. Got to grab the right pointing device and put my face back on there. Thank you. <laughs> on with today's topic. I mentioned this is about subflows in Flow Designer. So first, a quick tour of Flow Designer. Flow Designer came out in Kingston about 18 months ago, maybe a little bit more at this point, depending on when you're watching this. I think it, let's say Kingston, JK, London, Madrid, New York, Orlando. Has it been two and a half years now? Wow. Time flies when you're having fun, I'm pretty sure, because I'm having a blast. Uh, Flow Designer is the next generation of workflow. I don't really necessarily think of it as a replacement for the legacy workflow engine that we've all been using with that Visio kind of thing. It's It does replace that in a large sense, but it's also more encapsulating than that. It takes It addresses many use cases for business rules. It addresses many use cases for scheduled jobs in a very easy to construct manner and provides capabilities beyond what Workflow did in terms of delegated development. So now you can have business analysts writing some of these flows where you couldn't really do that all that well. They'd run into scripting things and it would get a little, little hairy on the older Workflow engine. So we've got that capability. It's in more of a natural language. Here's my trigger, here's some actions. And as a developer, you can build more actions. We showed that on the last episode. Well, now I'm going to get into subflows. So let me just show you where I was starting with a flow. I have one called course deactivated. So if you remember my use case from previous episodes, I've got courses, I've got projects, I've got tasks, I've got videos, I've got some of these tables that are interrelated. Well, each course has a task. So if I look at my course table, let me go to my CLS, not XLS, CLS, I'm not sure why. <laughs> why I had uh, Excel on the brain there for a minute. But I've got these various funny named courses like Fleen, and Fleen is currently active. I can see that from the checkbox up here. And it's got some tasks. Well, if the course becomes inactive, let's say we're shutting this course down, it's not going to be offered in the catalog anymore, let's cancel the tasks also. Very common use case for canceling a change. And you want to cancel all of the 
change tasks that go with that. Anytime you have this related list of records, you may do something to the parent record that affects the child records. Very easy to do. I could do this in a flow very easily, but it would it's not as extensible. We like to write our applications so that we have reusable components, and that's what subflows give us. If I put this all into a flow and simply said, all right, when the course is updated and active changes to false, I want to trigger this flow. Now, go look up the records in the task table that have a parent of the current course, close them out, maybe send an email, that sort of thing. And then I realize later, you know what? That closing child task thing is really useful. I'd like to use that elsewhere. I'm stuck. It's effectively like putting all of your code in a UI action and wanting to use the same set of code in a business rule. I don't have that subroutine or that functional layer that I can reuse. Subflows give us that. So that's the big advantage of subflows. You really want to use subflows if you want to call something more than once from multiple flows. So you want to call basically a flow section from another flow and another flow and another flow. You want to, and then the big one for me is uh, you want to specify the inputs and or the outputs. You want to interact with this and make it parametric so that it can pass in different argues and uh, arguments and have it behave in a different way each time. So much like you would pass, say, a glide record to uh, a script include function. I know I'm getting a little scripty on you. I use that as a back reference because many of us start with writing code, okay? unfortunately. Unless you're new to the platform and you're going, well, I don't understand the whole scripting thing. That's fine. Uh, quick plug, we do have a JavaScript series for that if you want to learn more about it. But not here. I'm not writing any script today. I'm going to be updating records without this. And you'll see how quickly and easily this is. And by using a subflow, I can reuse that logic as I'll be doing in a, a UI action. So let's just say, if I were going to be triggering the flow, then I would do it this way. But I'm going to take that logic that closes all the child tasks, it's just a couple of steps, and put that into a subflow. I can do that either with this plus over here and say, new subflow, or I can go back to this home screen where I've got my various sectional tabs and say, new, subflow here. I'm going to do it since I'm already here. Let's do this way, new subflow. Both of them bring up this properties box and I will give it a name, close course child tasks. All right, I'm going to put this into my CLS app because it is specific to that process flow, but I could make it available to other applications as well. Uh, or I can restrict it and say, no, this subflow is only available from this scope. Up to you how you want to do that. Good description. Get a course, course, close the child tasks. Okay, something to appear when you see that in the subflow menu. And I'll show you where this is manifested when you get that. Who is it going to run as? This is a Paris feature, so I can run it as the system user and bypass any security that may be on those tasks. Could be what you want, or you could do it as the user who is running the session. I happen to be admin here, so it doesn't make any difference for me, but something to think about. Now, another one for flows and subflows that's new to Paris is run with roles. So even if I, if I choose system user, notice that goes away. But if I choose me, I may be just an end user, but need a specific role added to do what I need to do. And I could say, oh, well, let's uh, pick a role here. Let's use the x underscore CCW or uh, this one, for example. I can apply that role to my profile temporarily while I'm running this nice Paris feature. For now, I'm just going to leave it alone. So just wanted to point that out. Those are new features to Paris. Now I have a subflow, and I get to specify inputs and or outputs. And for the input, when I say close the child task, all of those child tasks are related by a parent, just like all of my brothers and sisters have the same parents. So if you want to say, tell me about your children, you need to first go to all of the children. Maybe there are all the people in the room and say, are you, are you the child of this record? Are you the child of this record? Are you the We're going to do a very quick query on that. But first, we need to know who are the parents so we can ask that question appropriately. 
So I go over to this add new input here and say I'm going to pass it a course. Variable name is course. The type is going to be a reference. And notice I've got this little arrow to say reference to what? I'm going to reference my course table. It's going to be a course record. And this flow will not work if I don't pass it a course. So I'm going to make it mandatory. There we are. I'm not going to worry about outputs at this point. It doesn't output anything. I could potentially output the number of records I found, that sort of thing. Uh, but we'll get into that another time, I think. Well, let's do that. I've now got my input. You can see over here on the data panel, there's my input under the subflow inputs. And it is a fully functional course record with all of the attributes that go with that. Now it's time to say what I want to do on that subflow. First, we're going to look up records. So action, look up, and I've got plural and singular. I want to find all of them, so I'm going to use the plural. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything here. Let's go and look up the course tasks. So I've got lots of task tables, unfortunately. I'm going to look up x underscore 66238 CLS. And somewhere in here, I have a task. There it is. There's my task table. Naming your table task is generally a bad idea, like request. Yeah, I can't tell you how many requests and task tables I've had in my history. The filter for this is that the course is the course record I passed in. Very easy to do. I'm not writing any glide record queries and trying to remember ands and ors. And I just build it just like any other filter condition. I can get a maximum number of 100. I can order them if I have an order field or alphabetic. I really don't care at this point. I'm not sorting them. There's only a couple on each record. So I don't need to worry about limiting. That's my lookup. I now have a collection of task records over here in the data panel that was added with my action. And next, I'm going to add another action. This time, I'm going to do a logic, a flow logic, and say, for each task records, way easier than writing a for loop or a while loop, I get this new branch down here. And I could say, take each task record and update it. So I am going to update. You know what? I, I don't like scrolling. I'm going to type update. And there is update record. Which record? Oh, I love dragging and dropping these top level pills. It's so satisfying. I update my task record. And then I can either drop in a template if I've got one that says, set these fields this way. Or I can set them manually, which I will do here by setting the active field false. It's a checkbox. It's a true false field. So leaving this unchecked is false. If I check it, it's going to say, now set this to active. Well, it already was active. In fact, I could probably make this filter even better by saying, look up all the records for this course that are active. Maybe I've got 600 tasks and 598 of them are already closed. Oops, I want active is true. So modify that. And then I come back down here and say, well, let's set the rest of them closed and set the state. Again, very similar to what you would do for change tasks. That's probably one of the most common use cases. Or if an approval is rejected, go cancel all the child requests attached to that approval, whatever it happens to be. We are going to cancel those. Easy to do. And like a good flow designer designer, I have a comment on here. Set state equals canceled and active equals false. This one would be is pretty self-descriptive. Course is the course and active is true. I don't necessarily need a comment on that one. But this helps later when you're looking at it going, update record. I've got 17 update records in this flow. What does that one do versus this one? This helps with that. Let's save that. And now I can test it. I am going to test it on. I think Fleen has a couple of tasks here. Yes, it does. Active is true. State is work in progress. I've got a description. And I can test it without impacting the parent record. So I have my handy dandy little test button on the subflow. Another new Paris feature, running the script in the background. Very handy. I really wish I had this a couple of months ago when I was building my data streams 
because my integration was running and running and running and taking 15 minutes just to gather data from my REST APIs. And I really couldn't tell if it was running properly or not until it stopped. Maybe it was timed out, maybe it had an error, and then you go look at logs. If you run this in the background, it gives you a chance to use another tab to keep an eye on log files. Say, oh, it's running. These aren't the right inputs. Stop, 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 and cancel. So very handy. I'm not going to do this on this one because it's very short. Let's take Fleen as my input record. And you're saying, well, what's the difference between this and doing it in script? Well, I didn't write any script. It's run. I run my test flow. It says, I did your lookup records. I found two records, which is, well, that's good. I expected two records. They're down here. And I can see that runtime value here in count. Whoop. So right down here where it says, here's the count. Let's zoom back out. Come on, there we are. It did my for each and it did my update record. And if I expand update record, I can see exactly which fields it set, which records it used, and step through those if I like. So there's record one, there's record two. You could you look closely down here next to my head, right about there. You'd see the society is changing with those two records. One, two, I feel like the eye doctor. <laughs> which one do you prefer? That's the execution details. The flow ran. Let's go make sure that it ran properly. And my favorite shortcut, just click the breadcrumbs and it will refresh the list. Canceled, canceled, false, false. Fleen has been canceled. All right, with that tested, I believe this was work in progress and this was new. We'll just say that. We'll put these back so we can test it again. True. Sorry, that was behind my head. I just set the active field back to true. My head was in the way. Parent record is unaffected. Now, what have I got by making a subflow? I have a nice reusable component. I want to publish that so that I can plug it into. It's been tested. I have faith in it. I don't know if I'd put it in production yet. We may want to put some error checking in there or log messages. Go back to my flow. Now to close the child task, it becomes very easy. From this subflow menu, I could say, here's my CLS, close course child tasks. Nice for these cross-departmental flows as well. You build small components and say, hey, sales wants to keep doing this every time I you know, enact one of these actions. So let's, send, let's run the sales subflow so that they get records created where they expect them and I get records created when I expect them and everybody's updated and everybody's happy because it's a subflow. My input, there's my course input that I said I really want to pass it a record. I could hard code that or I could take the record that was used by the trigger. So when the active state on the course goes to false, now I'm going to go affect all of the child records. Easy flow. It looks kind of silly at this point because, like, well, I've got one trigger and one subflow. This allows me to build on and maybe call other subflows or call other actions or start looping through some other records. Do something else when this course is impacted. But I know that the child tasks are all taken care of in this subflow. That's what I get for doing this. Let's test that Let's for save. Do a little work, save a little work. Test, and I'm going to test this on the Fleen record and say, let's pretend, it's not actually going to change, let's pretend, <laughs> skip the trigger, remember when you test flows, you skip the trigger, that active changed to false because that's the condition I need to run this trigger. Really what I'm doing is running the exact same subflow from the flow with, with a parameter. So could also run this in the background. You see that there? Run the test. Run, 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 run. Just long enough to make you a little nervous. <laughs> Wish there was a way to make the pills work with list collectors, giving a display value, not the sys ID. Oh, interesting. You know, I haven't used them with a list collector yet. List collectors, are, the most common use case I've seen for list collectors are on, um, well, I guess either list fields or related lists. So I'm surprised that it doesn't put the display value on a list field. I ran this, it went into the subflow. I can see my subflow completed. And even better, I've got a twisty triangle out here. So if I expand this, all I see is the subflow. But if I 
expand it with the, the little triangle over on the far left, I can look at the steps inside of that subflow. So I can see the execution details for the subflow, and it says, oh, I don't have any records for you. I looked up all the records that match this criteria, and I got back zero, which is odd because I thought I set them back to true. Well, now they're false. Okay whatever happened there, but my end result is it's done. Not sure who, uh, who had a party on my child tasks, but it did what it needed to do, and I'll look into why it reported zero later. But it, it, it did work. Now here's the other advantage of using subflows. I can go into that subflow. Let's say for a moment I, de I, I haven't activated this yet, so it's not going to run when the actual record changes. I could automate that and say, all right, somebody somewhere changed it, either through the form, through another script, through another flow. They changed the active field to false and triggered this flow. But I may have situations where I want to set this flow in action. I want to ch close the child tasks manually. So I could either do it automated through a flow or manually through a UI action. Those are our manual triggers. I'll cover more about UI actions later. But now that this has been published, I go over to these three dots called a kebab. And over here, I have, see if I can find it, <laughs> copy the code snippet. Uh, I have the ability to trigger this subflow from a client script or from a server script very handy. I could run it synchronously in the foreground and make the user wait until all the actions happen. I could run it asynchronously, run it in the background and say, you know what, I'm going to do some stuff and you might have to refresh the screen later to see it take effect, but I'm not going to hold you hostage while this subflow is running. Your choice, synchronous or asynchronous. It gives you both code snippets here. I take this function, I take this little code snippet, copy code snippet to clipboard, that's done. Let's go make a UI action on here. Now, I could do this through Studio, which I normally do. However, I'm going to do it this old-fashioned way and say configure UI actions. What's the coolest part of the Paris upgrade, Chuck? Oh, Nathaniel, that's a good question. There's a lot. There's a lot. I will be covering that tomorrow. I forgot to mention that. Shame on me. We have one more day. I got to I got to make sure you are aware of and registered for. Thank you for the clue. Woo. That was Tech Now episode 77 on the Paris platform features tomorrow July 28th 8 a.m. Pacific time. What does that make it about 8:30 IST, 8:30 p.m. So not terribly late, but uh, early enough that you can stay up and watch that or get up early enough and watch that. If you don't, you, if you miss this, you're going to have to wait until September, actually till October, until I can air it publicly. If you DM me, I'll get you the private link. It will be posted probably by Friday the 31st. I should have this online. I do a little editing, clean up some oopses, that kind of thing to make the on-demand version a little bit cleaner. But you don't want to miss this. Trust me, you don't want to miss this. There's a lot of cool stuff in Paris. And I'm, I'm even now looking forward to the next release, Q for Quebec, uh, that is coming out next spring. So don't miss this. Get registered. Thank you, Nathaniel. I'll, uh, I'll probably have multiple times in the webinar when I say, this is my coolest feature. <laughs> All right. So let's get back here. Thank you. Oh, I ran the test twice. Did I run the test twice? All right, I'll trust you on that one, John. Let's go back and make my UI action and copy that code snippet in here. A nice commercial break. Click. I think my instance is just running a wee bit slow. Remember it says waiting for dev down in the far left? Let's call this one close child tasks. Wow, someone is really pokey. I pick the table. I need to say, what table do you want this UI action to appear on? And this will be on the course table. Yeah, don't tell me no, no matches found. You're full of beans. X662 38 CLS 323. Uh huh. Oh, I'm in global. That was interesting. Reload? Yes. See the advantage of Flow Designer? Unless you pick the scope. 
All right, now I have a course record. In fact, I can only pick tables. Oh, I guess I can't. All right, never mind. In some of these table pickers, you're limited to whatever's in the scope. I think it's UI policies when you're in Studio. I would like this as a form link called close child tasks. That should be a mandatory field. I'm not sure what they're thinking. I like to CLS course close task. I like to give an action name. Even if I'm not going to use it, it could come in handy later. So don't skip that field. Don't be lazy. I don't need to see this on new records because there are no child records. So I'm going to only run it on update. Let's also, I don't have any messages to pass to the client script. Comments are good due diligence. Close child tasks when parent, or when this is clicked. Okay. Do your future self a favor. I had a number of those this weekend saying thank you, former sober self. And paste that code snippet in here. Let's take this apart bit by bit. Let me blow that up for you so we can see it. Oh, sorry about the word wrap in here. This outer function is optional. Doesn't necessarily have to be in a client script. I'm going to leave, or excuse me, UI action. I'm going to leave it in here. What are the limitations of flows and subflows and henceforth actions? You're gonna have to be a little more specific than that. I'm not sure if you've run into limitations. Uh, there's, there's a number of things I found and I try to share those. They're not necessarily limitations. They're like, aha, that's how it works kind of things. So the try block, if you haven't been through our JavaScript, says let's try this code. And if it has some sort of error, maybe you specified the flow or subflow name wrong, maybe you have a, an issue, a runtime error, it will fail and go, all right, let's catch that. And the rest of your script, anything after line 18, will continue to run. Okay. If you don't have a try catch, it's going to crash and die and you'll get an error in the error log and you'll have to go see if you can find it. Meanwhile, people are clicking and going, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Okay, so try catch is a safety net for our code, just in case we did something wrong. I have an inputs array. This corresponds to uh, my list of inputs that I have on my subflow. It knows I already have one called course. So I specify it by saying, pass it the current object. In a UI action, I have this current object that refers to the current record I'm looking at. I'm on a form, I'm looking at a record, that is the current record. Now, if I want to start this asynchronously, I use the flow API. Ooh, new Paris syntax in here, I've noticed. It's not just execute flow or start flow or start subflow. This is the new way to go. Look at this, in background with inputs, very cool. So if I want to start this asynchronously, I can run this one. I'm going to run this one synchronously. It doesn't take that long to do. And for readability, I'm going to remove these comments because I don't need them today. I'm also going to make this a little easier to read by going like this. I will be covering a lot more of this on Tuesday. So this just kind of lines it up and makes the API a little easier to read for my poor tired eyes. It says, let's go run the flow API. I get a runner, give it the name of the subflow, whether I want it in the foreground or background. It also makes it a little easier to change when you want to change it. Here's my inputs using that object and outputs does get outputs. I don't have any outputs, so I didn't need to worry about them. That will allow me to start. This is the real engine of making that subflow run. So I've got my script. I would also like to stay on the, when it's done with that, stay on the current form. Traditionally, when you do a UI action, it goes to wherever it came from. So I can say action.set redirect URL current. That's a stay on the current page. Let's also, put in a message, gs.add info message, uh, child tasks closed, I hope, <laughs> if everything ran right. Okay. You probably wanna make more confident messages in yours. That's a UI action. I pasted something in, this would be a good low code experiment. If you're not real familiar with JavaScript, you can take what's there, modify it a little bit, put in a couple of statements and let's give it a try. So I go back to my course table. 
find good old Fleen. We're going to reactivate. There's my new UI action. Let's give it something to actually work on and say these are both work in progress, both active so that they show up in the search. Again, behind my head, changing the tasks. Anyway, let's go to close child tasks. It runs the subflow. Now, I know it looks like a whole bunch of messages on here. This is the only one we care about. These happen once when I'm in dev to create those cross scope permissions. It says, hey, I'm using the flow API. I give you permission. Da -da 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 -da. This is still active because I haven't triggered the actual flow. That flow isn't even activated. And down here, I see that my subflow did in fact work. Give you actual proof. The active field is false, array. The state field is canceled. Exactly what I told my flow to do. My UI message came up and said, child task closed, I hope. And I am still on the current form. Everything worked. I now have a piece of code. Actually, that just that one line is the real engine that I said. I go back to configure UI actions and say close child tasks, open that record. Having a code snippet is a really nice way to create a UI action using Flow Designer. Yes, it is. Even when the trigger, I'm reading John, uh, a comment off of the year. I thought it was John's. I read it wrong. Sorry, got to get new glasses. <laughs> Even when the trigger is only in the UI action as such and not started via Flow Designer. It is. This, this really, I mean, since I've started using subflows, I've reduced the amount of script includes that I have to write. A lot of that logic in script includes was go look up a record, calculate a value, send it back. Why do that in script? Anytime you're given a choice, I've said this before, anytime you're given a choice, whether you can do something in script or you can do it without script, do it without script. No questions asked. Trust me on this. You'll thank me later. Your coworkers will thank me later. The people who follow you up five years from now will thank me later. Take the no code approach. It's faster to build. It's easier to test. It's easier to maintain. You have less to worry about when you run upgrades later. It's just better. It may feel like it, 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 it's, it's not where you, if you haven't done Flow Designer yet, please look at it, take a look, go through some learning plans on the developer portal, get a free personal developer instance, start experimenting with it. Whether it's trigger based on a record updating, a scheduled event every night at 2 a.m., whether it's done as an inbound email trigger, there's different ways, a catalog item, you can trigger the flows, but also before you jump in and say, I need a flow for this, okay, because your mind will start doing that. Step one is, Get that muscle memory off of old workflow, off of scheduled jobs, off of business rules, and into flow. That's step one. Step two is asking yourself, should I take some or all of this logic and put it into a subflow? Because there's a potential to reuse it. Do yourself a favor and make yourself a library of subflows for that application or for that process. We, even if it's a, you know, your incident management process, put those into subflows because if you need to reuse that logic anywhere later, you really can't do that in a subflow. You can't say, take this subflow and turn it in, or, excuse me, you can't do that in a flow. Back up there, went a little too fast. You can't do that in a flow, and you also can't say, turn this flow into a subflow. Okay? So give yourself a head start, and even though it may seem like another layer of abstraction to say, I've got a flow that's triggered, and it calls a subflow, and that's all it does. Hmm. That seemed like a waste of time. It's not. You've given yourself the opportunity to reuse that subflow in other places. Okay, I think I've beat that horse enough. Uh, is Flow Designer more optimized somehow than writing an equivalent script? Shane, I don't have an empirical evidence on this, so I can't really speak to it. Uh, if there are some discrepancies in execution times, you know, if you're processing lots and lots and lots of records, uh, yeah, do some timing in the execution details on Flow Designer. I think I had those up. Let me cancel this. And I don't have any execution details, but I can always find them real quick. I'll show you where those happen. Under executions, I can look under any of the latest executions. It will tell me over here on the right hand side, this took 44 milliseconds to run. Okay. You could time that against a similar operation in say script background. How long does it take to close these two tasks? Boom, done. You'll find out. Uh, 
scale that up to 10,000 or 20,000 or 100,000 records, you know, you're going to see, potentially see a greater difference. I don't know. You're, you're, you may have to uh, check your own mileage. Your mileage may vary. That's what I was trying to say. Biggest confusion is our flows mature to replace workflows? Are they really here at all to replace them? If not, then why support says workflows will be unsupported at some time? We haven't, okay, the, the, the story behind flows and subflow, workflows came out in 2008, great way. It was built, it, it was the next generation of building onto form-based execution plans. Okay, we used to have to do workflows in forms to say, execute this step, do these tasks, then Graphical workflow came out. I think Pat Casey actually started some of that work and uh, handed it off to some other developers. If you want to go back into the Wayback Machine, that then, uh, but it's hit a limit in what we can do with that. As I mentioned, no delegated development. So you can't deputize people to say, go manage this workflow. The, eventually they're going to run into things. Flows, I don't think of them as, it's oftentimes when you see a workflow, say on your change request, it's this big monolithic thing and it's got rollbacks and approvals and multiple branches and joins. Okay. I like to think of flows as lots of little pieces that can replace one monolithic flow. One monolithic flow is very hard to test. As I've done that before with a change management process at a large pharmaceutical where it took 20 minutes just to get to the end and I had one piece of code that needed to run before the end of the script. And it took 20 minutes to set this all up. Create a new record, go through the approval, pick the CIs, blah, 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 and then find out my flow didn't work. Like, oh, what a waste of time. Okay. I could have taken that last piece, put it into a flow or a subflow, tested it, made sure that worked, and then when the right trigger comes along, that flow actually works. So you can take that and break it up into multiple pieces. It is a much better way. Is it going away? Is old workflow going away? No. Are we going to do any more development on it? No. Unless there's some critical bug that has to be fixed, which should have been shaken out after 12 years, but you know, I, I won't say never on that one. Can we build a UI action using actions? PowerShell from Flow Designer. Uh, you can, uh, can you build you? So the hierarchy of flows and subflows and actions. Actions can be used, and I built some custom actions in the last episode. So go back to the July 24th uh, community live stream video and you'll see that. Actions are the are reusable building blocks that do a discrete thing, like lookup records, like update a record, like adding two numbers together. Okay, you get the idea. You can build an action and use that in a flow or a subflow. In fact, if you look at the documentation page on why you want to use subflows, there's a bullet in there that says, so you can use actions uh, repeatable. I went, that, you can do that in flows or subflows. I don't get it. That bullet item just kind of went, Pff. somebody was thinking something and I don't know if the thought came out quite right. But you could write a flow, excuse me, you could write an action that you can use in a flow or a subflow that does a PowerShell action. You more than likely you need to use an integration hub to talk to a mid server, yada, yada, yada. Don't quote me on that. I am not a PowerShell expert and uh, I can't tell you the details of what it would take to do that, but that's the likely scenario. So check and see what you need. Personal developer instance is a great way to do that. Uh, I know I missed some questions in here. Uh, we did the optimize. Is it possible to pass the table to the impacted into the subflow that you built. Could you pass a table? I believe, John, your variable types include table. Oh, if I had my hands on the right home keys. Table name is there. So yes, you could pass in a table name, either as a data pill. So I'm not going to modify that. Um, modify, okay, cancel, yeah, fine. Most of those friendly data field type names are available, including some new ones for complex objects. You could say, I want to pass an array of objects, or I want to pass an array of strings, or whatever you want to pass into your flow. Great stuff. Uh, can we build a UI action using, uh, oh, I already read that one. Can a set of fields behavior by flow designer? I'm not sure what you're asking. Can I set a fields behavior by flow designer? You gotta clarify what you mean by behavior on that. Uh, I think we've got all of those. Can we can we use and insert hyperlinks in a send email action? 
you can you build a send email action this is one of the things about send email that I don't really care for in flow and that is when you send an email the idea of flow designer is that you don't get caught up in all the technical details it's meant for some low code capabilities however that being said you have this function field out here that you could put in your own script that allows you to extend that capability you can't put in things like dollar sign curly brace URI or dollar curlies dollar you know, these these things don't work because there's no such concept as current the idea is if you want the values off of that you pick them out of the data pill and say boom now I've got the created date in there a little easier than the whole dollar sign curly brace thing if you want to get to that level you would have to use a standard notification set the when field instead of telling you I'll show you okay so under notifications I am of course but uh, answering questions so under notifications if I spell it right notifications system notifications notifications and create one of these I actually prefer to manage all of my notifications here not some of them in workflow some of them in flow designer some of them okay put them all here it makes it easier to manage them and they'll show up in studio too so under when to send we've got typically when a record is inserted or updated you could still use this if you wanted to trigger them outside the flow and just say you know flows chugging along and say hey close some tasks you could then say fine go tell people their tasks are closed you could do event is fired this is typically done with the gs.event queue script call or if you've got another way to trigger events or triggered allows this to be recognized in the action step so in flow designer all I've got for send email is what I want to do what the record this is a pretty easy way to just say blast me an email but if you want to blast a certain email you would need to go create a custom action which we showed last week or yeah last week and send specific email let's put that in the CLS and there is a step in here some of you old timers will know I've been tripped up on this before right across the street from email is notification <laughs> that allows you to select which notification and these are the ones that are specified as triggered so this is what allows you to make use of that and if you pass it the record that is what gets passed in so you can do the dollar curly brace stuff so yeah bit of a workaround but it allows you to centralize your notification management and the downside is you would need an action for each type of notification because I don't believe you can data pill that I didn't check in time someone will have to double check me on that one uh, I've added some custom actions into the service now share that will generate an HTML link and be used in notifications flow designer very good thank you for contributing to the uh, share uh, fields behavior is done by UI behavior using flow designer still not sure I, I don't really come across the term UI behavior too much are you talking about client scripts and UI policies that kind of thing because flow designer runs server side it does not impact things that are running on the client so if you're talking about changing colors or dynamically selecting options calculating priorities totally different tool set this is for running a flow process so if it's if it's dynamic to the form changing in real time as people are tweaking forms and fields like make this mandatory when that's set to priority one or when you set this to close make these two fields mandatory or when it's completed make them read only that's UI policies that's client scripts not flow designer flow designer is going to be running on the server side so hope that cleared that up and with that I am going to wish you all a fond Monday unless you've already had a Monday let's do that and tell you to join me on Thursday at 2 p.m. UTC Ooh, checking my notes when we talk about reference qualifiers oh I forgot to give you a summary of why I do this again so back up sorry that's why I keep these things in front of my screen so I remember don't forget to tell you something some flows very flexible for work that can be reused 
always, whenever you start a new flow, think about what components could be better served as a subflow. Give yourself that head start on your own little private library of APIs. They can be called from flows. They can be called from server-side JavaScript. Uh, and, and note that, 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 that talk with David Liu and I did. Um, we had a story in there, if you watched that last week. David Liu is an actual person. He's one of the founding fathers of ServiceNow, one of the founding four. And we had to talk about technical debt and data debt last week. If you find yourself copying things over and over, a warning flag should go off in your head that you're doing this wrong. If you've got a flow that's got the same six steps, and then you write another flow that's got the same six steps, and you write another flow that's got the same six steps, you are going to give yourself a maintenance headache at some point because someone's going to say, hey, could you change that? I need to trigger a notification in here. Oh, I got to change it in three places. Anytime you see similar blocks of logic, it's time to start thinking, can I put this into some routine? Can I put this into some function? Can I put this in a subflow? That's where you're going to get value and thank your former self, or thank your, thank your future self. No, your future self will thank you, whatever it was. Uh, that way, next time you need to do a flow, again, think of doing a subflow first. So, I invite you to participate in the community. I invite you to join me on Thursday for reference qualifiers and community. I didn't put up the community link. Community.servicenow.com is where you'll find all that good stuff. This video will be posted there. You can leave comments there. You can leave comments on YouTube. I will get them either way and respond to them as quickly as possible. But for now, I'm Chuck Tomasi wishing you a very good day. Take care. Be safe. Learn. Share. Be helpful. Bye now.